right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So glad to see you all. So glad to see you all. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to allow people just to come on in okay. and just to come on in and be with us. Come on in. Happy Hump Day. It's Wednesday. Hello, Joanna. Good to see you. Yes. Now you probably can see me. Yes. <laughs> hey, Sister Tracy. Hello, Sister Tracy, Sister Joanna. Glad to see everyone. Sister Dora. And we don't own the rights to this music. Right. Good evening, Sister right. Maxine. Yes. Sister Rosie, hello. Yes. All right, just going to wait just a few more moments. Hi, Sister Lisa. Hey, Dionette. Hey, Charlene. Sister Charlene, hello, Mr. Dionette. Good to see you. Happy Wednesday. Hope you guys have made it. Had a great week, midweek so far. Good evening, Sister Phyllis. Yes. Yes, yes. Good evening. Good evening, Sister Linda. Yes. Come on in. All right, just a few more moments and then we'll be pushing in with our time for tonight. All right, in five, three, and one. All right. All right. God bless you all. Good to see you uh, on this great, great Wednesday uh, evening. I hope all is uh, well. Uh, let's just uh, have a quick word of prayer and then we'll move into our observations uh, for tonight. Father, we bless you and we thank you just for another moment. We thank you for another time to gather around your word. Pray that you would speak to us, that you would say those things you'd have us know tonight, that we might continue to be shaped and molded into the image yes. of your son. Thank you for your word mm -hmm. that encourages us, that teaches us, that challenges us, that yes. warns us, that delivers us, Thank that you, saves us, that keeps us walking in the right direction. Thank you for loving us enough to give us your word. You, now, uh, allow our minds to be open, allow our spirits to receive what you want us to hear and what you want to say to us on tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Again, amen and amen uh, to... Uh, amen. All right, all right. Amen. amen. All right, uh, just, just before we move into our time together, uh, just a few uh, observations really quickly. Uh, again, uh, I want to just thank those individuals uh, who continue uh, in some form or fashion to uh, support our uh, food box distribution on Saturdays. Thank God for the volunteers. Thank God for people uh, who take the time out to come out and to uh, be a part of, had several members, several ministries come out and be a part of time together. So thank you, thank you, thank you just for uh for your time uh, as we continue to try to, to reach outside the four walls of our church and continue to bless uh, our, our community. I uh, want to thank uh, 
Deacon Clarence Williams, uh, who just a few hours ago, 12 noon, uh, is still uh, teaching uh, our Hour of Power, our 12 Amen. noon Bible study. Many of you uh, are tuning in. Uh, if you have not uh, tuned in and would like to be a part of the 12 noon uh, Hour of Power Bible study, uh, you can call the church and get the Zoom link. Uh, it is solely uh, on Zoom for right now, but we just thank God for Deacon Clarence uh and his teaching we thank god on sundays uh brother steve gardner teaching our adults for the last several uh weeks and we thank god for all of our sunday school teachers who are teaching our children uh sister lauren sister uh, joanna sister gail brown and sister kenitra uh thank god for you all teaching the children even uh through zoom uh god bless you uh for your patience god bless you just for the anointing uh, that's on your life to be able to teach uh, children. So we thank God that the word continues to go forth. Thank God that you are with uh, us uh, 7 p.m. our Wednesday night in the word. Uh, and just thank God that you all are here with us. Uh, two things I want to mention real quickly. I may mention them before our time is over. Uh, you cannot turn on your television without seeing something about the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, especially uh, for African Americans, uh, we have a uh, kind of sordid history uh, dealing with uh, the medical uh, procedures and especially uh, vaccinations. Uh, many of you uh, remember uh, something called the uh, Tuskegee experiment, where literally, 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 they were injecting syphilis right. uh, into uh, into black folk and so many of us have a leeriness we have an apprehension about vaccinations uh so many things going around youtube and should you get it should you not get it we've seen videos of people who've gotten it and then certain things have happened and then there are other uh stories we hear where people have gotten it and there's no they haven't had any side effects or anything like that and so on February 25th, Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m., uh, there will be a Zoom call where we will have uh, healthcare professionals on uh, to educate us, uh, to give us accurate information, and to make yeah. sure uh, that they answer any questions that you might have that you know you might have regarding the uh, vaccination. Yeah. And so mark your calendars, Thursday, uh, February 25th. Uh, we will have a Zoom call. I hope we flood that Zoom call. You're able to ask questions. You're able to interact uh, with healthcare professionals. I thank God for Brother Steve Gardner, uh, who is instrumental in pulling this together uh, and making sure that it happens. We want to make sure you get the information. We want to make sure that it's right, that it's accurate, and that we're not believing everything that comes through. Because one day it could be positive, and the next day uh, it's all negative. So just want to make sure you have the right right information and then literally you still uh, have the ability to make your own uh, decision uh, regarding that but want to make sure that uh, that information is available to you amen yeah. and amen all right uh, normally uh, we want to begin our time uh, by utilizing our uh, Ask Pastor Brian uh, page. If you don't know, on our Facebook page, there is a group called Ask Pastor Brian. Uh, there is a nutrition group uh, on there trying to make sure that we uh, eat healthy or that uh, available uh, recipes and things like that are available to us. And then there is a fitness group as well, too, during this pandemic uh, many of us uh, have uh, put on uh, some extra pounds, and so uh, even fitness page may help you do a few more jumping jacks, may help you do some Amen. stepping, uh, but Ask Pastor Brian is in that group, and uh, there's one question that I want to address uh, that was sent in, and I will say from the outset that uh, uh, I probably will not answer the question. Well, not probably. I won't answer the question uh, in its entirety, uh, just based on just the nature of the question. But here it is. Uh, the question comes from uh, Revelation chapter 13, uh, and literally uh, the verses that are listed as uh, in the question is Revelation 1 uh, through 18. Guess what? There are only 18 verses <laughs> in Revelation 13. So literally the question is, what, what, what do I make of Revelation 13? So here it is. I've told you many, many times before that whenever you study the Bible, it is impossible. Somebody type impossible. It's impossible to understand a verse 
of scripture without understanding its context. Context uh, is uh, literally what is surrounding the text. The word context is made up of two words. C-O-N, of course, means with, and text means writing. Uh, so context literally means what goes with the text. So whenever you're reading one verse of scripture, you always want to make sure you read uh, the verses uh, prior to that verse and then read the verses that go below that verse uh, to help you get the context. Many of you know uh, you said to people in arguments who have butted in your conversation and made a statement uh, that was literally out of context and you have said to them you don't even know uh, what the context of uh, the conversation is. Literally what you're saying is is that uh, it's an A and B conversation and because you don't know the context you can see your way out of it. If you never, never, never consider the context of a particular verse, you can take it out of context and oftentimes you will not have the proper meaning of a verse. So for an example, um, uh, my grandfather, my grandfather uh, would, would, would use the verse that uh, a, a woman shouldn't wear that which pertained to a man. And he would use that as the principal verse to say that's why women should not wear pants uh, in church. All that is well and good is just taken out of context. Uh, because in its proper context, if you're going to use that particular verse to uh, make a stance or statement about women wearing pants, in its immediate context, it also talks about you not wearing garments that differ in fabric. So you can't wear polyester and cotton. You can't wear denim and polyester. If you're going to wear something, it has to all be a whole denim suit. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be a whole polyester suit. Anybody remember polyester suits? My grandmother made me a couple of polyester suits uh, and had the belt around it and all those kinds of things, polyester. Uh, if you're going to use that verse, you have to also use the verse. Same context says that a woman uh, should not go to uh, the synagogue, the temple, the church, if you will, uh, on her menstrual cycle. All of that is in the same uh, context. And so as it relates to Revelation, please listen, listen, listen to what I'm saying to you. I cannot, I cannot and will not, you cannot take one chapter out of Revelation and try to explain it. It's, it's, it's an impossibility. I'll say it again. Revelation is meant to be studied comprehensively and it's meant to be studied uh, you know, from book to book, uh, chapter to chapter. And oftentimes to get a proper understanding of Revelation, you have to read some Old Testament books as well. You cannot read Revelation without reading Daniel uh, and uh, parts of Ezekiel because all of that uh, parallels and it makes sense. So listen, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot uh, help us come to a proper understanding uh, of Revelation 13 because some of what happens in Revelation 13 uh, is an extension of what happened in 12 and what happened in 11 and what happened uh, in, in 10. But what I will do uh, is try to give you kind of an understanding. I'll answer a couple of questions from Revelation 13. Uh, and clearly, clearly, we may need to do a comprehensive study, uh, not just on Revelation, but what uh, is called eschatology. It's called the uh, doctrine or the teachings of last things, what's going to happen uh, in the end times. And so uh, maybe we'll, we'll do an institute for that uh, because a lot of that uh, is uh, a lot of information. A lot of it is a lot of reading. Uh, and so sometimes people just, you know, casually are laying in their bed and they say, oh, I'm going to look at, read the book of Revelation. And uh, you cannot understand it without having a comprehensive view of uh, the book of Revelation. And let me just say this just for, 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 for this. It's not the book of Revelations. It's a revelation. God gives John on the island of Patmos a revelation. So please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, please don't refer to the book of Revelation as the book of Revelations. It's, it's one revelation, one, one revelation given to John. Now, to help me answer some things in Revelation 13, let me give you this really quickly. And I got to do it quickly because I need to get to our lesson in the middle of a series. Uh, John, uh, uh, Paul writes these words and he says that Jesus is coming back. Trump 
is going to blow. Trumpet is going to blow and he's going to come back. He's not going to touch the earth, but the church, the people who are believers in him, both alive and dead will be caught up to meet him in the air. Mm -hmm. All right. And let me just, and let me, I'll, I'll say, say that for a minute. We'll, we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Are you all with me? Somebody say we're with you. We're with you. Be caught up to meet him in the air. Listen, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it, it's talked about. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's talked about. Uh, sometimes we use the word rapture. The word rapture is never used in the Bible. Uh, the Bible says that we will be caught up. The word caught up is the word harpezo, which means to be snatched out or to be plucked out. Mm -hmm. So at any moment, uh, nobody knows when. Even Jesus didn't know when, uh, when uh, his disciples asked him when he was, was coming back. Uh, but at some point in time, the Bible talks about being ready. The Bible talks about his imminent return, which means you don't know when. You just need to be ready. As a matter Matter of fact, uh, the apostles, especially Paul, they always talked about Jesus returning because when they saw him leave, they didn't think that it was going to be thousands of years later that he returned. They were expecting him to come back, you know, very, very soon. When I was growing up, many of you, you know, we sung the song soon and very soon we are going to see the king. So here's what I need you to see. Listen, listen, listen. When the believers who believe now are caught up, we will be caught up to be with Jesus, his father. When we're taken out of the earth, two things will happen where the believers are. The first thing that will happen is we'll get rewarded for our works down here on earth. I've talked on that many, many times before, and it's not what you do. It's the motive behind why you did it. So when you sang a song, when I preach messages, if I've done it with the right motive and with the right intent in the heart, which you could never know, I'll be rewarded for it. So tonight, you don't know, you don't know if I want to be here tonight. You don't know if I'm really feeling this. You don't really know. Only God knows and I know what's really in my heart. And if I'm doing it for the right reasons, I will be rewarded because I had the right motive. The things that I've done and I did not do it with the right motive and the right intent, it will be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble. Are y'all with me so far? Somebody type, we're with you. The second thing that we'll do is something that I say every communion time is that we'll have the marriage feast of the lamb. And it is in this marriage feast that as the church, which is the bride of Christ and the groom, which is Jesus Christ come together, we'll have literally a wedding reception. And it is in this reception that we will drink new with him uh, the cup in our father's kingdom during this wedding reception. Are y'all in the building? Now, normally in Jewish culture, a wedding reception lasted for seven years. Somebody type seven, seven, seven. It lasted for seven years. I'm sorry, seven days, seven days, <laughs> seven days. I'm, I'm ahead of myself, seven days. So listen, listen, listen. When the Believers are taken up out of the earth. On the earth will be something that will take place called the Great Tribulation. Now, if you ever do any study on Revelation, what you will first discover is there are several different interpretations about the book of Revelation. Some people think that the church will be here during the Great Tribulation. Some people think that there will only be a few people here during the Great Tribulation. And then other people think that the church will not be here at all during the Great Tribulation. I lean towards, based on what I've studied, that the church will not be here during the Great Tribulation. So here it is. The church is caught up out of the earth realm. We're judging, getting judgment not for sin, but for our works. And then we are now participating in the marriage feast of the lamb on earth. There are still people here because everybody was not saved the time, during the time where Jesus came. So listen, so for seven years, there will be something on the earth called the great tribulation. Let me give it to you again on the earth. There will be a period of seven years. And if you ever study Revelation in connection with uh, the book of Daniel, you'll see how uh, these weeks and three and a half weeks and all these things come together. But it will be seven years. Somebody type seven years, seven years of great tribulation on the earth. Now, listen to me. Even during this time when the great tribulation transpires, 
believe it or not, people will still have an opportunity to give their life to Christ and confess him as being the son of God. The only problem is it's going to be a whole lot more difficult now because during the great tribulation time, mm -hmm. two things will happen. The world system will be ran by an antichrist. I'll give it to you again. The church is caught up, but on the earth there are still people here. Holy Spirit is gone. The only reason the Holy Spirit is here is because of you and I. So if you think things are bad now, can you imagine if there's no Holy Spirit? And one of his uh, uh, functions is, is that he is the restrainer. He's restraining some things. Could you imagine if the Holy Ghost wasn't restraining and holding some things back, what the world would be like? Well, if, if you're still here during the Great Tribulation, no holes will be barred. It'll be just evil, wicked at, 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 at its best and at its highest. So listen, so when we come into Revelation 13, the first thing that I want you to understand, if you are a believer and you believe that we won't be here during the great tribulation, after chapter four of Revelation, all the way to chapter 19, it doesn't even involve the church. We won't be here. If you are a believer now and God comes, Jesus comes for his church, whatever happens on earth, you won't even be here. So the things that are talked about in Revelation uh, of, of 5 all the way to Revelation 19 don't involve us, the believers who've come when Christ comes, because we will be judging for our works and we will be participating marriage for each of the Lamb. We won't be here. In Revelation 13, it speaks of two beasts. Now listen, when you read the book of Revelation, a lot of it is figurative. A lot of it is symbolic. A lot of it is metaphorical. And so when you see in Revelation 13, if you ever read it, it speaks of two beasts. One beast comes out of the sea and one beast comes out of the earth. The Bible says that it looks like a leopard. It has the feet of a bear. All that is symbolic. And it has uh, 10 heads and uh, I believe seven horns. I forget, uh, seven, 10 horns. Uh, you go, go read it. It's there, but, it, but it's a beast. And one of the beasts is symbolic of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. The other beast is symbolic of the uh, system of, uh, or, or an empire or a nation or the world system, if you will, as to, as to how it's going to, to, to be going. And then the other one is symbolic of, of the false prophet, the false prophet. And so literally, uh, you can't read uh, Revelation 13 without having a greater understanding of what's happening uh, in, in the whole book of Revelation, what's happening in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians 15, and what's happening you know, through uh, several uh, chapters and books in Daniel and Ezekiel. Uh, otherwise, you'll, you'll have a, a out-of-context, spotted view of what's happening uh, in, in Revelation. But any serious uh, study of Revelation uh, will do us good. The Bible says it's not a book that we should run from. In chapter 1 of Revelation, it says that whoever reads this book, its revelation, is blessed. And so don't be afraid of it. So it's not talking about literal leopards that have bare feet and seven heads. None of that is really coming. It's all symbolic of oftentimes nations and empires and people. And in Revelation 13, that's what... Uh, that's what you have. Uh, I don't have time to talk about the symbolism of what uh, the leopard and the feet that, that are like bears and the heads. All of that is 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 within its context. And so uh, if you're interested uh, in uh, studying through the book of Revelation, I probably will not do it. Uh, I have a couple of Revelation scholars who would love uh, to teach a, a class on the book of Revelation. So if you're interested, just type, just type Revelation, yes, just Revelation, yes. And uh, if there are enough people who are interested, we may just form a class uh, and uh, I'll let uh, our Revelation scholars uh have at it. All right. That's, that's the best I'm going to do on, on tonight. 
Uh, if you ever study through the book of Revelation and you take a class on it, it is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it takes a lot of study. It takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of uh, going back from Old Testament to New Testament to really understand uh, the book of, of Revelation. But it will be a great, great study. So if you are interested, just type Revelation, yes, and then we'll see uh, and we'll, we'll kind of take it from there. But every, every so often uh, somebody asks something, from the, asks something from the book of Revelation and we want to make sure that we're able to uh, accommodate them. All right. All right. Amen. That's the best I'm going to do tonight. Uh, so we are in the midst of a series entitled I'm claustrophobic. I'm claustrophobic. If you were not with us on last week, amen. Uh, God bless you. Uh, you still are in good time. You still are in good place. Uh, I will give another introductory uh, kind of message, a teaching tonight, and then we'll begin to start talking about some specifics. Uh, on next week. Uh, so first Chronicles, first Chronicles, uh, uh, is where we'll be, where we'll be tonight. First Chronicles chapter four, first Chronicles chapter four is where we'll be tonight. Uh, and so, uh, if you can meet me there, first Chronicles chapter four, and then we'll begin, we'll begin our time tonight. First Chronicles chapter four. Are you there? No, you're not. I'll wait for you. <laughs> First Chronicles chapter 4. First Chronicles is in the Old Testament. Uh, it's right before Second Chronicles. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 4. Uh, and just before we read it, uh, I want to just uh, begin our, our time tonight. We will, we will read it. But not just yet. So hold you. I'm, I want to give you time. So as we're learn, as we're learning and walking together, we won't have have trouble uh, finding it. First Chronicles chapter four. Are you there? Amen. All right. I'll give you just a few more moments. Uh, First Chronicles chapter four. And again, we'll look at a couple of other different things, but I just want to make sure that uh, you are at our uh, principal, principal text. All right, are you there? All right, uh, we, we are in the midst of a series called I'm Claustrophobic. Uh, many of you know uh, that there are several, several different uh, phobias, several different fears. Uh, one of them uh, is something called claustrophobia. Claustrophobia is the idea uh, and the fear of being in enclosed spaces. Uh, it's the idea that I cannot be in something that is enclosed, something where I don't have any room, something that I don't have any breathing room, no stretching room. And if I'm in a position like that, I begin to panic. I begin to uh, physically lose it because I am claustrophobic. Well, I know that claustrophobia is a fear, and I, I submit to you tonight, as I submitted to you last week, that every believer uh, ought to be claustrophobic. There is no reason uh, why you and I ought to be boxed in. There's no reason why you and I ought to be caged in, fenced in uh, for the believer. Everything that God speaks to the believer does not speak of being confined. It speaks of freedom. It speaks of liberty. It speaks of abundance. It speaks of liberty. It speaks of going further. It speaks of surplus. It speaks of overabundance. And so for the believer, uh, if you are not claustrophobic, then you and I have a problem. Because if you're not claustrophobic, that means you are content being in the space that you're in. If you're not claustrophobic, it means that you are content being in the little box that you're in. And God says, no, it's not about us being in a box. It's not about you being in a reserve uh, space. It is about you uh, attaining and a uh, 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 and, and going the furthest that you can go. And uh, uh, I believe this. I believe this. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says this. He says, uh, greater things that I have done, you will do. You missed it. Let me give it to you in my, 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 my language. He says, I've done some great things. 
but there are some greater things that you'll do that I haven't even done. Are y'all in the building? Now that's surprising because Jesus walked on top of water, but he says you'll do greater things than that. Jesus healed blind eyes, but he says you'll do greater than that. Jesus done a lot of phenomenal things, but he even said that you will do greater than that, greater things that you will do. So here it is that Jesus tells his disciples and tells us that I know you see me do some great things, but you will do even greater uh, things in your life. You don't believe that. If you ever read through the book of Acts, Acts chapter five, verse number 15 gives me a surprising, surprising example of what Jesus says. In Acts chapter 15, the Bible says uh, uh, Peter is literally walking down the road and he is casting a shadow. And the Bible implies that if people could just get in Peter's shadow, they would be healed. Jesus never done that. Jesus had to speak. Jesus had to touch. Jesus had to command, but there is no record of Jesus ever walking. And if people could just get in his shadow, that they would be healed. Peter could just walk and people would be healed just by being in his shadow. Are y'all in the building? He says, you'll do greater. You'll go further. You'll do more. Uh, You'll do more miracles. You'll do many different miracles than I did. And I came by to tell somebody, I don't know what your dreams are. I don't know what your ambitions are. I don't know what it is, but 2021 ought to be the year that you decide that I got to be out of the box. I got to move out of where I am. I'm tired of being comfortable. And sometimes we risk being uncomfortable because we like being comfortable. At least where I am, I know what I'm doing. At least where I am, I know the people that I'm around. At least where I am, I'm at the top of the heap. At least where I am, I'm a big fish in a small pond. But you ought to know that God's call for your life and mine is never to be in a boxed in space. It is always that we go bigger, that we go more abundantly. That's why Jesus says, I have come that you might have life, that you might have life and have it more abundantly, more abundantly. He uses two superlatives, more and abundantly, more abundantly, which means if I'm having something in abundance, it's not just filled to the brim. Abundance means that it's overflowing the lid, that it's going past the limits, that it's going past the the, the place where you should stop pouring. It just overflows and overflows and overflows. That's how your life and my life ought to be. But if you are in a box, if you are confined, if you are in a small space, you are not living up to God's potential because God's potential is always to have life and to have it more abundantly. Are y'all in the building? So if you don't hear anything else I say tonight, I need you to hear that your God is a big God. Somebody say that to yourself. Your God is a big God. And because he is a big God, he can do big things. I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. Wait for the curveball. You serve a God that is big, big, over the top. You serve a God that is just over the top. Anybody ever meet people where you always say, oh man, you over the top. Oh, you doing the most. Oh, you doing too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how our God is. He just does the most. He does the most. He is a big God. Somebody type God is big. God is big, 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 big. Now listen, listen, listen. If God is big, and he is, then why don't we pray God-sized prayers? Ah. Come on, I'm I'm, I'm, going to put something on your mind. If God is big, you just said God is big. I say type God is big, somebody up type God is big. My God is a big God, he's a big God. Then why don't we type, uh, why don't we pray big time prayers to a big time God. Are y'all in the building? He is a big God and yet we don't pray big prayers. Are y'all in the building? If you ever look in the Bible, there's over 222 uh, worded prayers in the Bible. And most of them, when I read them, are prayers surrounding something that they want God to do big. Are y'all in the building? Now, this is not you. This is me. This is not you. This is me. This is not you. This is me. Have you ever wondered that when you pray, that God is your father and that there are some things that you pray that him being your father, he's going to do anyway. You still don't have it. Let me give it to you again. God is our father and he's a big father, big God. And if he's a big God and he is our father, come on, stay with me tonight. I need you to start thinking about this. And there are some things that he's going to do regardless because he's our father. What do you mean, pastor? I mean, a good father always protects his children. 
So guess what? God is going to protect you. So do we really need to ask him to protect if as a father who always protects, because that's just what fathers do for their children. Are y'all in the building? We ask Lord to provide. That's what good fathers do. Good fathers ought to provide. So if he's going to do that anyway, is that really a prayer that we need to even pray? This is not you. This is me. I'm not telling you what to pray. I'm giving you something to think about. I'm expanding your mind. Get out of the box. I need you to start thinking bigger. I need you to start thinking different. Get out of your box. So at night, anybody, anybody, anybody know you pray, pray, the Lord pray, Lord bless my mama, bless my brother, bless my kids, bless me, bless our house, protect my car outside, bless this. And then those are the extent. And when you think about it, him being your father, guess what? He is supposed to do those things anyway. So the question then becomes, if I don't pray for those things, will God not do those things? I differ. I beg to differ that if you never said, Lord, protect me, he's going to protect you because that's the nature of a father. If you never said, Lord, uh, make sure there's food on my table, I believe that he will still provide that without the prayer because that's the nature of a father. Are y'all in the building? This is not you. This is me. I'm giving you something to think about. So if God is going to do certain things based on his fatherhood, then I believe there are times God is waiting with his arms folded in heaven and he's waiting for you to act something big because he specializes in being a big God and a big God is waiting to do big things in your life and mine. But I do believe that if you never realize that God is a big God and you never realize that you can pray some big prayers that are out, that are out of the box of Lord bless my family, bless me, protect me, all those things we say going to bed, then you'll miss the big God that you talk about because you're afraid to pray big prayers. Are y'all in the building? When was the last time you prayed a big prayer? When was the last time, Lord, you just prayed something out of the box, prayed something out of the ordinary, prayed for God to do something that is literally out of your mind when you serve a God that says he is able to do exceedingly, that's over the top, exceedingly and abundantly, that's more than enough, and he's able to do it more than you can ask it out of your mouth and more than you can think. Y'all missing that. We serve a God that is able to do more than you can say out of your mouth. So the God that you serve can do more than you can even articulate out your mouth. We serve a God that can do more than you can even make it and put together in your brain. So whatever you put together, God can do more. Whatever you can articulate out of your mouth, God is not limited by it. And so I wonder, am I talking to any out-of-the-box folk that are not afraid to say, I want to pray some big prayers and out-of-the-box prayers. Why? Because I serve a God that is out of the box. So... <clears throat> So instead of praying uh, for a house, why don't you pray for an apartment? Instead of praying for an apartment, why don't you pray for a whole office building? Come on, I need out-of-the-box thinkers. Instead of trying to get a loan, why don't you pray that, Lord, I want to be the lender. I want to loan folk money instead of trying to bag and borrow from somebody else. Where is the person on tonight that says, Lord, 2021 will be the year that I pray outside of the box? Because I submit to you that if you never pray for protection, your father is going to give it. I submit to you that if you never pray for food on your table, God is going to give it. I submit that if you never pray for your bills uh, to be paid, God knows what you have need of. And because he is a father, he is going to do that regardless. That's not you. That's me. That's just what I believe. And so I move from talking about this. Yes, I want him to bless my mom. Yes, I want him to bless my children. But there are some other big things that I want him to, to where I want him to say, you know what, Never, nobody's ever asked me that. I want him to say, nobody's ever asked me to do that. Where are your prayers where God has to scratch his head and say, you know what, that's a good one. That Brian, that is a good one. Nobody's ever asked me that. Are y'all in the building? I ain't talking to everybody. I'm just talking to 10 folk right now. I'm talking to Sister Esther. I'm talking to Minister Dionette. I'm talking to Diane. I'm talking to those individuals that understand we serve a big God and a big God. God is looking for big prayers. Can I give you an example? Let me give you that. I have kids like many of you. And when they say, daddy, 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 uh, can you buy me a, a, a blouse? Can you buy me a pair of shoes? Can you buy me this? Those are things they ask all the time. Are y'all in the building? But if one of them comes to me and says, daddy, can you buy me a car? I don't want just a car. I want a Mercedes. I might scratch my head. 
But as a father, guess what I'm going to start doing? I'm going to start trying to figure out how it can be done because she's coming and asking her father. Are y'all in the building? They ask for something out of the box. They ask for something bigger than they normally did because they know I can do shoes. I can do clothes. I can do uh, gifts. They know all of that stuff and I do it all day, every day. But there are times where they ask me for some things where I got to stop the presses. I got to think about it because now they are asking their father something outside the box and it's not that I can provide it it's not that I won't do it it's that now I have to really now now begin to rearrange some things because they've asked something out the box yeah I know God is all powerful and he's all thinking but just figuratively when was the last time you asked God something that stopped him in his tracks when was the last time that you asked God something so outside the box that God had to back up and say is that really who I think it is 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 that really Jeremy? Is that really Phyllis asking that? Is that really Donald asking that? Is that really Brian asking that? Because normally he always asks me things in the box. But now that he's maturing, now that he's growing, now that it's 2021, he has the audacity to ask me something that is outside the box. I can ask him because he says I'm a big God and I can do exceeding and abundantly above all you could ever ask or think, are y'all in the building tonight? Look at somebody tell them I'm claustrophobic. Somebody type, I'm boxed in, I'm fenced in, I'm caged in, and I'm tired of being in this space because that's not God's intention for my life. Are y'all in the building? Woo! Ah. Now look, look, look. In First Chronicles chapter 4, we are introduced to a man named Jabez. Now, several years ago, there was a book. Everybody went and went. It was a bestseller worldwide, worldwide, called The Prayer Prayer of Jabez. Now, if you read it, God bless you. I'm going to share with you some things tonight that wasn't in Bruce Wilkinson's book. It ain't in Prayer of Jabez. This is Brian. This is B.D. Hunter. Come, 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 come. Jabez, 1 uh, Chronicles chapter 4, is spoken of in the midst of, of a book of names. If you ever read the book of First Chronicles, what you would discover is it's a book of names. So and so begot so and so. So and so begot so and so. Name after name after name after name after name after name. When you get to First Chronicles chapter four, verse number uh, uh, around verse number eight, I believe, we are introduced, and it seems as if the monotony stops with Jabez. Come on, stay with me tonight. It stops with Jabez. And the Bible says that Jabez is known for doing one thing, and that is he prayed. Are y'all in the building? He was known for doing one thing, and he was known for praying. If he died, on his tombstone, it would say, Jabez, a man of prayer. Now, since I know you have it, uh, I need you to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Look, if you will, at verse number 9. Verse number 9. Verse 9. Only two verses, but it's packed in there. I need you to stay with me. If you want to get out the box, if you are claustrophobic, this is going to help you tonight. Verse 9 says, And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him in sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, enlarge my territory, that thy hand might be with me, that thou wouldst keepest me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Are y'all in the building? Listen, listen, listen. Jabez prays a prayer, but I need you to see that his prayer solely, solely, solely centered around him being claustrophobic. <laughs> the prayer centered around him getting out of the box. I'm going to show you to, I'm going to show you in a minute, but I need you to see the background as to why he requests such a thing. Here it is. 
The Bible says that his name was Jabez. Somebody type Jabez, Jabez. And what you will discover about Jabez is that the word or the name Jabez uh, is significant in that when people in biblical times named their children, names were significant, names were attached uh, to certain events, names were oftentimes uh, 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 affirmation, oftentimes prophetic, uh, and what people named them, uh, uh, what, what, what a person named a child was very significant. Uh, I have a niece, I have a niece who is going to give birth to a, a child on a couple of days, uh, a, a couple of days from now, and uh, a couple of days ago, uh, she was asking the family, you know, what, what, what should we name him? And, and they have, you know, different names. We have to make a choice and choose which names. Why? Because names are significant. Because every time in biblical culture you called a name, uh, it was speaking to destiny. It was speaking to an event. It was speaking towards what or something that had happened. Now, listen, listen, listen. When Jabez is born, the Bible says in verse number uh, nine that as his mother birthed him, she birthed him in sorrow, in sorrow. Are y'all in the building? In sorrow. Somebody type sorrow. And as a result of birthing him in sorrow, the Bible says that she named him Jabez. Listen, Jabez, the name Jabez literally means pain and sorrow. Are y'all in the building? In other words, every time she called his name, she was saying pain. Every time she called his name, she was reminding herself of the pain that she went through while she was birthing him. Uh, it's the idea that as she was birthing him, she did not have, you know, an easy birth. <coughs> She did not have a birth to where there was no complications. Obviously, whatever happened during the birth, she birthed him in pain and birthed him in sorrow. Y'all in the building. So every time his name was called, somebody said, uh, 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 there goes pain. They would say, come here, pain. They would say, come outside, pain. Every time his mother called his name, she would now be referring and bringing up pain. Now, listen, listen, listen. Jabez did not go through pain. His mother did. Come on, stay with me tonight. Jabez did not go through any kind of pain, yet he has the moniker, he has the name pain that rests on his life. His mother went through pain, not Jabez. Come, come, come. And Jabez bore the name of pain and sorrow because of something that his mother went through that now his mother puts on him. Are y'all in the building? I'm talking to any real folk on the line tonight that recognizes that I may be in a box. I may be closed in, uh, not because of something that I've done, but because of something somebody else has done. Is there anybody that has ever gone through pain in your life and you're going through pain not because because of something that you've done, something that you've messed up, but you're going through pain, you're going through an issue, you're going through something in your life because of what somebody else has done, because of somebody, what somebody else has put you through. And Jabez says, I am where I am, not because of something that I've done, but every time my name is called, it reminds me of the pain that my mom put on my life, and I need to find a way to shake out of that pain. So I need you to see. He was in a box of pain. Even his name spoke to his pain. Now listen, listen, listen. The Bible says that his mother named him. That's significant. His mother named him because in biblical culture, the daddy always named the child, especially a son. I'll give it to you again. Bible says that his mother bare him in sorrow and the mother named him Jabez. That's significant because dads always name the children, especially boys. But his mother named him, which could imply that he grew up without a father. So here he is in pain. Pain that was put on him by somebody else. Pain that his mother went through. So we don't know if it was pain in childbearing. Don't know if she was abused by the man uh, that she had the child with. We don't know if it was in emotional. We don't know if it was physical. All we know is that something attached to the birth of Jabez caused her pain. We know then that because she named the child, uh, that biblical culture would state that a father names the boy, but he was nowhere around. Otherwise, he would have named the boy himself. So here is Jabez 
in a box of pain. And now when we get to first Chronicles four, guess what? He's claustrophobic. <laughs> he wants to get out of this box of pain. And we'll talk about emotional boxes and all those things later. But he realizes that where he is, what has been put on his life, has caused him to be inside of a box. Are y'all in the building? And that's not just Jabez, that's you, that's me at times. Is there anybody that knows that you have limited yourself based on your past, based on your experience, based on what other folks said you could never do, based on what other folk have done, and then you say, I can never do that, and you have limited yourself based on your past. Everything that Jabez was limiting himself from was not based on a present, not based that he was fearfully and wonderfully made, it was simply based on his past. So here it is. Here it is. Here it is. He wanted to break out of the box. Now listen, I want you to, I want you to hear this. It's possible to desire to want to break out of the box and still not do it. Let me tell you why. This is me. This is not you. This is not you. This is me. This is not you. This is me. I believe that discipline is a decision. I don't necessarily think that God is the one that makes you be disciplined. I believe that God gives you gifts. I believe that God gives you resources and it is up to you to be disciplined in your decisions that I'm going to put to good use what God has given to me. That's me. That's not you. Now, I know God can do anything. I know God can work it out, but God is not going to do what you can do. Are y'all in the building? I believe discipline is a decision. I decide I'm going to walk every day. I decide I'm going to go to school. I decide that I'm going to get the work done. Is there anybody in here that recognizes that oftentimes breaking out of the box is a series of disciplines over and over and over and over again? Are y'all in the building? Because if I was in a box and I knew that I could break through, you know what I would start doing? I would not just hit it one time. I would keep hitting it over and over and over, I wish I had somebody over and over and recognize if I keep hitting over and over and over again, I'm going to break out. That's kind of like what discipline is, that I'm not just going to do it one time. I'm not just going to do it a couple of times. I'm going to keep hitting it and doing it and going. I'm going to keep hitting it and hitting it until I recognize there is a breakthrough out of the box that I am in. You don't look at movies, but I do. You don't look at movies, but I do. One of the greatest and best movies that, uh, of all time is a movie called Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank Redemption uh, is one of the great movies of all time. Uh, I can watch it over and over and over again. It is a great movie. Uh, it is centered around a man named Andy Dufresne who was framed uh, for a murder that he did not do. Uh, and the going joke in the movie was when people would ask what you're in for, uh, everybody would say, uh, I'm innocent. The only problem was, was that uh, Andy Dufresne was really, really the only innocent one in Shawshank Prison. Now, here's what I want you to see. Uh, one day while in his cell, he noticed uh, that he uh, 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 could take a chip out of the wall, out of the cell block that he was in. And so uh, after a matter of years, over years, over years, while everybody was sleeping, what he was doing was, even though he was in a cell that had him locked in, uh, he would take a little rock hammer and he began every day for years and years, just continue to uh, claw through that wall. And year by year, uh, it began shorter to where he was able to tunnel out of the prison. That's what discipline is all about. He was in a cell, but it did not happen overnight. It took him years to uh, break through that cell, ultimately to his freedom. And I came by to tell somebody that if you're going to break out of the box, <coughs> it may not happen once. It may not happen in a week. It may not happen in a year, but you got to have the discipline. <coughs> excuse me, to keep clawing, to keep pushing, to keep elbowing, to keep hitting it. And if you are disciplined in your decision, I believe that you will be able to break out of your claustrophobia. Now, listen, listen, listen. Jabez says, I'm enclosed by pain and I'm sick of it. I wish I could just stop right there and say, sometimes you just got to get sick of it. Sometimes you got to get sick of yourself. Because there's nobody else to blame sometimes, but you know you're lazy. No, you've procrastinated. No, nobody held you down. You have the money. You work good job. So there's nobody else but to blame. It's my fault. It's my fault. 
So he says, I'm sick of it. Anybody ever just get sick of yourself? And everybody else is saying, man, how come you're not doing this? How come you're not doing that? You're gifted to do that. How come you're not going to? And there's nobody else to blame but yourself because at the end of the day, I don't, you didn't have the discipline to follow through with what God had placed on your life. Listen to me. So Jabez says, I'm sick of it. So he says, I know, I know, I know what I'll do. I'll pray a big prayer to a big God. Can I give you these and I'll let you go? Here's what he says. He says, Lord. Verse 9, bless me indeed. Now, come, come, come. When you read the original text of verse 9, it does not say bless me indeed. What it does say is bless me, bless me. <laughs> it's the idea that he's saying, Lord, bless me big time. It's the idea, Lord, I just don't want one blessing. I want a big old blessing, and I need you to bless me big time. Are y'all in the building? Is there anybody on the line tonight that is willing to pray a big bless me indeed, a big bless me, bless me kind of prayer? Lord, I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed in 2021. I want to be a blessing to somebody else in 2021. I want to be able to be a lender and not to bar. I want to be the head and not to tell. Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me big time. Somebody type big time, big time, big time blessing for a big time God. He starts off by saying, Lord, bless me, bless me. I've been in this box. I've been in this cage. And the first thing I want you to do is bless me. Now, listen, listen, listen. He says, bless me. But remember, he's in a box. Remember, he's been boxed in by pain. So the first thing that he says is, Lord, I want you to bless me. Bless me indeed. Give me a big blessing. Bless me big time. Come on, I feel that right there. But then he says, Lord, enlarge my territory. One version says, enlarge my space. Somebody's getting it already. Enlarge my room. Enlarge my real estate. Enlarge the place that I am. Why is that important? Because he recognizes where he is is in a box. But he just said, Lord, bless me big time. So how can God, Jesus, fit a big time blessing in the box that he's in? Some of y'all want to be blessed, but you're not willing to expand your territory. You're not willing to expand your, and if you don't expand, God will have to shove in a big time blessing that was never intended to be put in the space that you're in. It was intended to be put in a big place because a big blessing from a big God requires a big place. So Jabez had it right all the time. He says, Lord, bless me, but I don't want you just to bless me. I don't want you just to take away my pain. I don't want you just to let me go further. I want you to bless me big time. Somebody type big time, big time. But he also recognizes that the big time blessing that I'm, I'm asking for cannot be done where I am because where I am, it won't hold a big time blessing. So, Lord, enlarge my territory. So I came by to tell somebody your dreams are too, too little. He needs to make them bigger. Your ambition is too small. He needs to make them bigger. Uh, what the money that you want is too small. You need to make it bigger. Your dreams that you're dreaming are too small. You need to dream bigger. Get out of the box. So God now can give you the big time blessing you're looking for. But if you stay where you are, the blessing that God has reserved for you will not fit where you are. Somebody type, get out the box. I feel that in my spirit. Get out. Get out of the box. So don't talk about being blessed if you're not willing for the Lord to enlarge your territory. And enlarging your territory oftentimes means that you got to leave people in the old territory because everybody doesn't want and can't can comprehend the big blessing that you're talking about. Anybody ever talk to your friends and you tell them, you know, what you're trying to do and what you do, and they say, oh, man, go on with all that. You should just do this. this. Be content with what you have. I don't know why you want all this and want to do all that. No, no, no. Don't talk to them. They're in the old territory and they will never understand the big God that you have that honors big blessings and big prayers and you need to enlarge your territory get out the box meet somebody else ask somebody else go down there this year open up your mouth this year 
Enlarge your territory because the blessing that God wants to give and what you're asking for, he'll never drop it in your life because your box is too small for his big blessing. Are y'all getting this? Some of us have missed God's biggest and best in our life because you are content in your box. Well, I came by to tell somebody, I hope you get a case of claustrophobia this year that where you break out of the box and the blessing that God intended for you last year and 2013 and 14, all those years you missed it because you've been inside a box afraid to ask God, afraid to ask anybody, afraid that God won't do it. God will do it, but he needs to be in a place to where he can put a big blessing into a large territory. I'm, I'm blessing myself tonight. I don't know about anybody else. I'm blessing myself. Preach, Pastor. I receive it, Pastor. I, I, I'm blessing myself. Can I give you an example? Anybody remember years ago, a couple of years ago, everybody was buying SUVs. You had an Escalade and, you know, the Tahoe. And so everybody was driving. They had, you know, rims on. They had, you know, uh, uh, the TVs in the, <clears throat> in the uh, headrest. Everybody riding on, you know, dubs. And they had, the, you know, a uh, uh, big, big SUV. Uh, and guess what? I, I, I bought one, too. <laughs> I bought one. I bought a Suburban. bought a Suburban. And, and, and it was a long truck, long truck, big truck. Uh, 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 and, and we drove it home. And. And, and, and pulled it into our garage, and we had a problem. The truck was too long <laughs> for our garage. It was too long for our garage because we had boxes at the head of our garage. So guess what we had to do? We had to enlarge the territory so that the truck could put all the way up to the front of the garage to fit the length of the truck. Are y'all in the building? I speak that into somebody's life tonight that there is some stuff you're going to have to move. There are some people you're going to have to move out the way. There are some mindset you're going to have to move out the way because God can never fit the big time blessing that he wants to put in your life in the space that you're in right now. Are y'all in the building? And so I encourage you that you need to move some boxes, move some stuff, and then whatever God is going to do in your life will be able to fit perfectly because you've enlarged your territory. Are y'all in the building? Look, look, look. Then he says, Lord, bless me big time. Lord, 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 your big blessing is not going to fit my box. So enlarge my territory. Can I give you two more and I'll let you go. He says, keep your hand on me. He recognizes that the hand that blesses is the same hand that I want to make sure stays on the blessing. Because I never want to disconnect the blessing from the blessor. So I always remember that the blessing is not coming from anything that I've done, but the blessing is always connected to the blessor. And as long as I'm with the blessor, I'll always be connected to the blessing because wherever the blessing is, the blessor is somewhere in the vicinity. And as long as I'm connected to the blessor, I'll always be connected and have access to the blessing. I think I just said something. Anybody ever have a friend and if they got money, that means you got money too? Anybody have a friend that if they go shopping in San Francisco, you don't have no money to shop, you're waiting for your check on Friday, uh, but they they just got their stimulus check. They just got some EDD money and they got some money to spend. And if they buy some shoes, they you buying shoes as well too. Are y'all in the building? And it's not because uh, uh, any abundance of yours. It's not because you got a credit card to swipe. It is because you are connected to your friend and your friend knows that if I got a dime, you got a dime. If I have shoes, you're going to have shoes. If I'm eating, then you're eating. And Jabez says, Lord, when you bless me and enlarge my territory, keep your your hand on me because I don't want to have the blessing without the blessor. Is there anybody in here that could ever look back over your shoulder and recognize that once you got the blessing, you forgot all about the blessor? Well, Jabez says, no, Lord, I don't want to forget all about you. So keep your hand on me. Keep your hand on the blessing. So that way I'll make sure I do what is right with the blessing. Are y'all in the building? Can I go further? The Bible says this, that if you delight in the Lord, listen, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Verse does not mean that if you delight yourself, he'll give you whatever you want. No, 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 no. It means that the closer I get to the blesser, 
my desires and my heart begin to change. Are y'all in the building? And so as I get closer to the blesser, he'll give me the desires of my heart. But the desires of my heart are not what I desire. It is the desire of the one who is blessing me. So he will give you the desires of the desire who is blessing you. And the desires of my heart does not come from me. It becomes from the one who gives me the things that my heart ought to desire. Are y'all in the building? He says, keep your hand on me. And here's what else he says. Keep your hand on me so that no evil comes on me. No, 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 no. That's not what he said. If you read the text carefully, here's what he's really saying. He's really saying, Lord, keep me from evil. He could have said, keep evil from me. But he says, keep me from evil. You still don't have it. He could have said, Lord, keep evil away from me. But he says, keep me from evil. Are y'all getting it? You see the difference? Evil away from me means that I can be doing what's right, but I don't want evil to get nowhere. Keep evil out. But that's not what he said. He says, Lord, deliver me or keep me from evil. How? Why does he say that? Because Jabez knows Jabez. Brian knows Brian. Are y'all in the building? Come on, don't laugh at me. Jeremy knows Jeremy. Stacy knows Stacy. I'm looking at your names. Sabrina knows Sabrina. Diane knows Diane. And even after the Lord has blessed you, even though you've enlarged your territory, you still have a tendency of being you. Are y'all in the building? Anybody ever got a blessing and based on your own flaws, your own choices, your own sin, your own mess ups, that you literally mess up the very blessing that God has dropped in your life? Come on, I need honest folk right along in here to recognize. God's been gracious. God's been good. He's been graceful. He's been gracious. He's blessed you over the top. Bless you big time. But because I know who I am, I have a tendency to take what God has blessed me with. And because I know me and I can mess it all up. Are y'all in the building? I need real folk in here that, that would be honest enough to say I've been down that road. And if the Lord didn't hold me, if the Lord didn't keep me, if the Lord didn't pull me back, because if the truth were told, there is some things that I really wanted to do. Is there any honest folk on the line tonight that says, no, there are some days where I'm not feeling real Jesus-y, if you will. There are some days I don't want no church. There are some days I don't want to read the devotional. There are some days, don't put your hand on me. I don't want you to anoint me. There are some days I'm getting up. You're getting up looking for something to get into. Are y'all in the building? And the enemy's tactic is to make sure that whatever my thing is will be something that will now mess up the very thing thing that God has placed in my life when he blessed me and enlarged my territory. So somebody ought to be honest and say, 2021, I'm not falling for the same trick, devil. In 2021, I got to have some more self-discipline to make sure that I stay back, to make sure I restrain myself, to make sure that I yield to the power of the spirit, because now I'm getting too old to just do that. I'm getting too old to fall for that. I'm getting too old to mess with that. I'm getting too old just to keep doing that over and over. So Jabez says, Lord, after you bless me, after you enlarge my territory, he says, make sure that I don't mess it up. Don't let me, don't let me, don't let me be the cause of my blessing being messed up. Are y'all here? And guess what? I've messed up. You messed up. All God's children messed up. And for those of you trying to jump holy, talking about things I used to do, I don't do no more. Come on, can we be real? Some things you can't do anymore. <laughs> there are some things you can't physically, mentally, you can't do it anymore. So now that you can't do it, you can't wear it, you can't drink it, you can't roll it, you can't do what you, now you want to jump holy, not because you don't want to, it's because you can't do it anymore. Some of you are not doing it, not because you don't want to, it's because you haven't had any offers lately. Ain't nobody texting you. Ain't nobody calling you. And so it's easy if you ain't have no offers, ain't nobody pulling you here, ain't nobody pulling you there. It's easy to say, Lord, you know, I'll jump holy and all that. No, 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 no. Jabez understood with the blessings come temptations. With the blessings come obstacles. With the blessings come pressure. That's why you always have to realize that there is a backside to your blessings. So for every promotion, there's pressure. 
Are y'all in the building? And so for every elevation, there's also obstacles. And oftentimes we see the promotions and the elevations and we see the accolades, but we don't see the pressure. We don't see the burdens. We don't see the stress that is on the backside of any blessing. And so Jabez, I'm done tonight, y'all. Jabez says, Lord, I've been in this box. I'm claustrophobic now. Pain is now getting the best. I got to break out of this. So his prayer was to a big God to do some big things. Lord, bless me. Big time. But your big time blessing requires me to have a larger, a larger space. So enlarge my territory. Are y'all in the building? Bigger blessings require bigger responsibilities. Bigger blessings require, and some of us are not ready to handle big, big blessings because we're not ready to handle the big responsibility that comes with the blessings. But he says, bless me, enlarge my turn. Keep your, excuse me, your hand on me. And keep me from evil. And the Bible says, the Lord granted his request. After that, you never hear anything about Jabez. Nothing. The one thing he was known for was praying a prayer. He didn't do any miracles. He didn't walk on water. He wasn't a, the leader of a, the nation. None of that. Couched in name after name after name after name in the book of 1 Chronicles, he stands out as a man who prayed big, dangerous prayers. And when you look at people in the Bible that prayed prayers, very rarely do you see them praying things like, you know, uh, uh, some of the things that we pray about and how we pray. They're praying big things. Joshua said, Lord, don't let the sun go down until I defeat my enemies. That's a big prayer. Are y'all in the building? <clears throat> Moses stands at the Red Sea and says, Lord, I need you to part through. That's a big prayer. <clears throat> Abraham and Sarah trying to have babies at 99 and 100 years old. Pre-Viagra. That's a big prayer. Are y'all in the building? When there was famine in the land, God feeds Elijah by the side of a brook. That's a big prayer. God provided in a famine. You got a, you got a refrigerator full of food. You just don't want to eat it. You just don't want to eat Mexican because you ate Mexican the night before that and the night before that and the night before that. But you don't have a famine. So to pray, Lord, provide me with food in a famine, and he does it, that's a big prayer. <clears throat> when they stood before the walls of Jericho, they said, Lord, we don't know how. And he says, this is what you need to do. Walls come down. That's a big prayer. So tonight, this week, I need you to pray some out-of-the-box prayers. Don't just talk about how big your God is. Don't just shout about how big your God is. Because I'm a firm believer that there has to be something distinctive and different about the believer connected to God than people who don't know him. That's why oftentimes, I'll give you this and I'll let you go, God says <clears throat> when he was introducing himself, he would say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, if you look at their life, Jesus, listen to me, somebody. If you look at their life, and what I've done for them, I am the God that did that for them. And so if you want to know how bad of a God I am, if you want to know how awesome I am, you don't got to take my word for it. Just look at Abraham. Just look at Isaac. Just look at Jacob. And so God uses their name to make them great. But knowing that when, that when God makes their name great, that they also make God's name great. And I want somebody this year for God to use your name. Come on, are y'all in the building? 
When folks say, you know, who is this God? When folks say, I don't believe in God, they ought to be able to look at your life. God should be able to put you on display. And he said, you want to know the kind of God I am? Well, look at Brian's life. Look at what he's done. Look at how big he prayed. Look at the stuff I've done. You want to know how big God is? Look at Stacy's life. Look at Charlotte's life. Uh, look at Sabrina's life. If you want to know how big of God I am, just look at their life. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of Brian. I'm the God of Lori. I'm the God of Wilma. I'm the God of Oranda. I am that kind of God. And if you want to know the kind of God I am, you don't got to use my name. You ain't got to say Jehovah. I'll just begin calling the names of the people who are connected to me. And if you see what I've done in their life, it ought to prove how big and how great of a God I am. But we can never boast on how great and big of a God he is if we're not praying big prayers and allowing him to do big things in our life. Because the bigger he is in our life, the bigger he is to the world. And he uses your life and your experience to point to him so he'll illuminate your name and make your name great and then you make his name great. That's why God says to Abraham, I will make your name great. Not so you'll be famous, not so people will talk about you, but that when they see you and see what I've done in such a big way, your name will now illuminate and highlight my name, which is what should happen at all. So oftentimes we short circuit a world who wants to see a big God that is something different that has never been done in the lives of other people and because we won't pray big prayers we now shut down the bigness of God in our life because we limit God to our own box and this year you need to get out of the box and it starts by praying big prayers I'm done y'all I'm tired today big prayers He's dealing with his pain. And he says, I'm tired of being boxed in there. I'm tired of being in a place to where uh, uh, I'm triggered by my pain. If somebody says this, if somebody talks about I don't have a daddy, if somebody talks about it triggered, I'm tired of being in that box. You ought to be tired of being triggered by this, triggered by that. And, and, and you're in a box when God wants to do more. And I'll say this as I close. This was, was profound to me. Lord gave me this. He says, many of us are reading a butterfly Bible where we should be flying and enjoying life, but we live caterpillar lives. This has to be the year that you uh, have a metamorphosis, that you have a transformation, never to go back the same way. I'm not going back to the box. When you get out of the box, you need to burn it, you need to stomp it, you need to destroy it because you'll never go back to the way it was. <clears throat> <clears throat> that ought to be good news. You'll never be as broke as you were. <laughs> You'll never be as depressed as you were. You'll never be as uh, 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 without a dream or ambition as you once were. You'll never be as undisciplined as you once were. You're never going back to that. Somebody type never going back. I'm never going back to that. I'll never be as broken as I, I was before. I'm never going back to that. I'm breaking out of this box with discipline, discipline. I'm breaking out of the box with disciplined discipline so God now can fit the big blessing that he has. And the blessing is not just for you. You're blessed in abundance to bless somebody else. And so if all you want is to bless yourself and your house and your children, that's not the kind of God we serve. He always blesses more than enough so we can bless somebody else. Anybody remember when the boys went out to fishing and they didn't catch nothing? Jesus says, cast your nets on the right side. Uh, they caught so much fish that their net was getting ready to break. And then there were other little boats all around. And they had to now share their fish with all the other little boats who didn't catch anything that night as well. It wasn't just fish for them. It wasn't just fish for their household. It was fish so that as they're blessed, their boat was about to sink. And they would have sunk and they would have lost all of their fish if they had not now begun to bless somebody else. So bless me indeed is not just bless me, myself, and I. It is bless me indeed that I might be able to bless somebody else. Yeah. Jabez, I'm done, y'all. Praise a big prayer, big prayer. to a big God. Big yeah. And he does it in a large territory. Yeah. If your box, if you're in a box, your God is too small. Yeah. Yeah. If you're in a box, your God is 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 a little teen ainchy God, as my grandmama would grandma would say. A little teen ainchy. You don't know what teen ainchy means. It just means real. It means real small. It's tiny. Now, 
Next week, <clears throat> we'll take another step. The last two weeks, last week and this week, kind of introductory. I just need you to know the kind of God that you serve. Thank you, He's Lord. a big God. He's a big, big love, big grace, Ooh. big blessings. Big. 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 And we're going to begin getting to some other things that go from the inside out. I don't want you to be claustrophobic. Phobic. No believer should be content being boxed in by people's opinions, by people's uh, uh, what the, your reputation, your past, none of that. So let's pray, and I want to give you some observations after I pray. Uh, I need you to hang in there, especially if you're a member of Berkeley Mount Zion. We're going to pray. There's something that I need you to do that you need to be a part of, and I want to give it to you as we close. Father, we bless you, and we thank you for your word tonight. <clears throat> we thank you that you've given us examples such as Jabez, given us example of people in pain, just like we can be, people who are boxed in by pain and past and reputation, people who are in pain because of what other people have put on them and what other people have gone through. And yet his prayer is to a big God for big blessings. And I pray this year, not so much for the blessing, but that you would allow us to break out of the box I pray a claustrophobic spirit on every believer that they will not be comfortable, they will not be content with the box that they are in, but they would have discipline, discipline to be able to break out of that box and achieve the things that you have for their life, that they might be a blessing to themselves and their household, and that they might be a blessing to somebody else. Thank you for what you said tonight. Thank you for what we have resolved tonight. Thank you not just for what we heard, but for the action that's going to be taken <clears throat> as we move into uh, the ensuing weeks, into the ensuing year. I thank you for just being a big, big God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Somebody just type big God, big God, big God. So listen, uh, I want to leave you with this. Uh, many of you know that if you are a member of the Berkeley Mount Zion family, uh, this year we celebrate 75 years as a church family. 75 years, 75 years. And for all intents and purposes, uh, we will not be able to come together uh, in our sanctuary uh, as we normally would to celebrate. Uh, I, don't, I don't foresee things uh, turning around that much to where uh, we'll be able to convene in our sanctuary. But this is what I need you to do. <clears throat> If you could, uh, Sister Cami, I need you to pull up the uh, uh, email address that says Berkeley Mount BMZ. So listen, this is what we're going to do. Many of you, uh, if you ever looked at sports during this time, uh, and they were kind of, you know, uh, during the Super Bowl, <laughs> they kind of tricked me a little bit because I was looking up and it looked like the stands were full. A couple of times, I'm a baseball fan. I like just going to the to watch the A's. Uh, it's best time of my life. I just sit there and just eat hot dogs and nachos and peanuts and chili popcorn. and sunflower seeds and popcorn and soda and cotton candy. Uh, I went, one day I sat there and I said, whoever come down the thing, I'm just going to order it. Whoever, if it's hot chocolate, if it's uh, uh, dipping Dots, whoever came down, whatever, whoever they were, I was going to, okay, amen. Come on back, Pastor. But, but, but during this time, even in the you know, baseball games, they have these uh, portraits of people that look like they're in the stands. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was clever, thought that was novel. I said, you know, I'm going to send in you know, my picture. They can put my picture up as if I'm you know, in the stands. And I thought that was clever. So here's what we're going to do for our church anniversary. Mm -hmm. I need you to send a portrait of yourself. Now, make sure it's your best, amen. Uh, you can, you know, if you wanna wear your Sunday best, that's good, but make sure it's a good portrait, not a, a, a you know, uh, full-size portrait. We don't need you standing with your GQ thing. You know. We just need <laughs> your, a portrait means your face. <laughs> it means kind of quarter length. You know, so we're not posing, we're not, you know, sitting in the wicker chair. We don't have, you know, throwing up your peace sign and all that. We need a portrait. Are y'all somebody type portrait? Y'all understand what I mean? And we're gonna take those portraits and as they do uh, at the baseball game, basketball game, we're gonna put those portraits in our sanctuary uh, and we're gonna do some creative things during our church anniversary time. So listen, the email address you need to send your portraits to. Somebody type portraits, your portraits. And listen, it's not a family picture. 
It's not a family reunion, family reunion photo. It's you, you, one picture, one portrait. And I need you to send it to the email address that is on the screen now. BMZ dot turn 75 at Berkeley Mount Zion MBC dot org. I'm gonna let that stay there for a moment. Write it down. Uh, this, this broadcast will be up. So if you know someone that's not on, that needs to be on, tell them to go back, tell them to fast forward. No, don't tell them to fast forward. Tell them to li listen to the message. And <laughs> the, the email address is at the end of the, uh, of the, uh, of the study. But uh, I need as many people as we can to begin you know, sending in your portraits uh, and we're going to put them up. Uh, if we can remember, you know, where you sat, we might even try to put your portrait in your favorite uh, seat. You do know sometimes when the pastor stands, I know people are not there uh, at church because uh, you sit in the same place every Sunday. Amen. And sometimes you'll fight, uh, you'll fight uh, if somebody is sitting in your seat. Ain't it good to know ain't no seats now? <laughs> Ain't no seats. I wish you would come into my house talking about that's my seat. No, this is my seat. Uh, so again, send your portraits, your portraits, your portraits in, uh, and we need to uh, begin uh, our work on that. So flood us with your portraits. A address is on the screen. I'll let it stay up just for a few more moments. Amen. So while you're looking at that, I need you to continue uh, to pray for several of our members. Please continue to pray for Reverend Stanley Campbell. Yes. Please continue to pray for uh, Reverend Melinda Matlock and her mother. Please continue to pray for uh, um, Mother Dozier. Please continue to pray for the family of Sister Cartwright. Uh, praying still for the brother of Sister Karen Gray, Brother Gregory Gray. Still praying for Samuel Moses, the brother of Sister Esther Gatson. Still praying for Jeremy's uh, mother. Please continue to keep her uh, in your prayer. Still praying for uh, Sister Okima's father. Uh, he is continuing uh, to, do, to uh, do a lot better. So please continue to keep all of them in your prayers. Uh, praying again for uh, Sister Barbara Henry. The Lord called her son Bernard home. Uh, we're also praying for the families of Sister Verna Walker, Sister Diana Mitchell, uh, Sister Jean Woods, uh, Edith Swagger, and also praying for Sister Arkeria uh, and uh, for the loss of her daughter, Kiana. Kiana. And so please keep all of them in your prayers. We are honored, I told you many, many times before, that even though we're not gathering uh, we're not gathering uh, in this uh, sanctuary space that people are still joining our church. And, and so I wanted to just uh, welcome uh, Sister Tanya Edwards, uh, Roger Mason, brother and sister Clayton Boatwright. I married them, y'all. Uh, Marshawn Adams, Sharon Culpepper, Annette Williams, and Michelle Butler, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Berkeley Mount Zion family. Uh, we will, we will uh, have a, a Zoom fellowship. I want to get to know you. I want to talk to you personally. Uh, and so thank you for, for just becoming members of the Berkeley Mount Zion family. Uh, it's a joy to have you in our family. We receive you and embrace you uh, and just want to, to make sure that we get to know you a little bit better. So again, hopefully you got the email address. Please send your portraits in. Listen, no couple pictures. I don't want your wedding picture. I don't want, you know, the picture of you at the gala. It needs to be an individual, one face portrait. Come on, if you've never seen it, go look at an old basketball game. Go look at a football game. It is a portrait. Uh, if you're going to do something with your kids, kids are fine, but it needs to be in a portrait. Amen. <clears throat> amen and amen. So next week, uh, we will continue uh, going a little deeper with our series, I'm Claustrophobic. Uh, if you have a friend, if you have a loved one, somebody that you know may be uh, blessed and may be benefited by uh, our study, I encourage you uh, to tell them to tune in. If not, I encourage you to share it with them. Share it anyway. Uh, share it with your friends. Share it with your other Facebook uh, friends. Share it, share it, share it. You'll be surprised that there are some churches uh, that are not on, some churches that, you know, are kind of not uh, doing anything in terms of, uh, you know, 
studies and continuing. And so this may be a blessing for them uh, during this, this particular uh, time. So again, Berkeley, Mount Zion, thank you, thank you, thank you. I look forward to seeing you all on Sunday. We will have our normal watch party uh, on Sunday uh, at 10 a.m. I'm looking forward to some few special things that will be happening uh, during our watch party. So please come and stay tuned. Uh, and at 845, Brother Steve will be playing some good gospel music. And at 9 a.m., we will go right into our uh, Sunday school time. And uh, our children will also be uh, in a uh, Sunday school as well. So if you are interested in sending your child to Sunday school, please call the church to get the Zoom link and make sure that we have our children in Sunday school. We do not own the rights to this music, but God bless you. The uh, song simply says, thank you, Lord, for being there for me. So God bless you all. Have a great, great bless. week. And we'll see you on Sunday. Bless. Love you all. Thanks, Cammie. Thank God. Thanks. My God was going.